treating uh, corn stover and trying to use it as a corn replacement feed in feedlots and as well as in cow-calf operations. Um, so with that, I, I started my own company and we manufacture a 2,000 pound uh, range supplement that is designed for higher intake to replace forage uh, in drought situations, as well as uh, increased stocking rates on pastures where the uh, upfront cost has gotten very high. Well, thanks, John. Today we've got John Klein on the podcast. John, thanks for uh, jumping on and uh, being part of the podcast. Uh, to give a brief overview, um, can, can you just you know give your experience where, where you're at today, how, what you're involved in agriculture? Uh, you're part of or owner of CRF Consulting. Correct. Yeah. Give, give an overview of what you do and how, how you got there. Sure. Uh, again, my name is John Klein. I'm the owner of CRF Consulting in Dunlap, Iowa. Um, prior to starting my own business, I, I worked for uh, a Perina dealer. I've basically been in the feed business for over 30, 30 plus years. I uh, worked for Perina and Land O'Lakes and then to ADM, left ADM in 2015. Uh, did a bunch of work for ADM in the research and development of the corn stover project. So we were treating uh, corn stover and trying to use it as a corn replacement feed in feedlots and as well as in cow-calf operations. Um, so with that, I, I started my own company and we manufacture a 2,000 pound uh, range supplement that is designed for higher intake to replace forage uh, in drought situations as well as uh, increased stocking rates on pastures where the uh, upfront cost has gotten very high. So we're just looking at trying to do some different things using uh, fiber sources that we impact by uh, chemically treating them, uh, making them more digestible. So it's kind of a unique product. Uh, we've been manufacturing those we started some of the initial research in 2015, but really uh, commercialized it in 2017. And business continues to grow quite rapidly. And uh, I guess that's kind of where we're at today. We manufacture them here in Dunlap. I've got five employees um, that uh, help manufacture here. So but that's kind of where I'm at today. A healthy digestive tract is a prerequisite for overall calf health and performance. It affects the absorption and utilization of nutrients and influences the calf's immune system. Digesteron Calf from DSM Firminish is a phytogenic product that can help benefit gut bacteria to improve gut functionality, immunity, and performance. Take care of your calves with Digesteron Calf. Visit dsm.com forward slash Digesteron to learn more. I guess tell me a little bit about this product. You know, forage costs are, are extremely high. Yes. Um, and so you think about from a cost production side of it, you know, 65% or so of my cost production is associated with nutrition. Uh, and so we, we've got high feed costs. And uh, so go in a little more detail about this product and some of the benefits that, that you know, cow-calf producers could have by, by utilizing it. Correct. Okay. So, you know, one of the things um, with the corn stover research that I did uh, with ADM, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to work with John Deere and Monsanto and Hilco. There was, there were several different companies that uh, were involved in that process. And uh, there's certain things that we can do to certain types of fiber sources that make them more digestible. Um, my goal was to try to figure out a way that we could utilize well and it was adm's goal as everybody else was uh, all kind of gearing toward ways to remove residue off of off of corn ground in, in particularly and wheat and uh, make that fiber more digestible and more um, available to ruminants and so by doing that we get we we address two problems. Number one problem is forage is getting harder and harder to find 
uh, for running pastures, especially here in the Midwest. But I think it's kind of in general. I think, you know, there's a lot of people that are always looking for more pasture. And with that, you know, we need to make sure that uh, what we're doing is sustainable and we need to make sure that uh, we're addressing all the potential issues that can come up when you start a new project. And that was one of the neat things of working with those other companies is we had a lot, an excellent group of research people and scientists that helped really kind of see the value and try to point out potential problems. And, and so in that, that scenario, you know, we, we, uh, we know that sometimes things that are in a cornfield aren't really good for cows too. And that's kind of how we got into the biofix and, and some of the potential issues there. But, and then it also led into some other neat ideas that <clears throat> I quite honestly think were overlooked by all of us at that time. And maybe it, maybe it wasn't as noticeable at the time when we were doing the research back in, you know, early uh, 2011 or so. And I think today <clears throat> with some of the things that we've been um, oh, basically pointed out from DSM people, quite honestly, um, there were some things that I think we overlooked and we knew there was a potential for it, but it was probably a bigger issue in drought years than it was ever. And so, you know, one of the, one of the things that kind of clued me into some of the things that DSM is offering is, is, um, when we hit those drought seasons, uh, the potential for mycotoxins goes higher. Um, just a lot of funky things happen when we get into droughts. And, you know, when we were in the Dakotas selling blocks up there, you know, three years ago during the drought and, <clears throat> and, you know, the, the conception rates, the thriftiness of the calves and some of the things that were going on was kind of like scratching our heads where, you know, we're throwing everything at these cattle at that time that we thought we needed for drought. <clears throat> but one of the things that quite honestly was overlooked was the beta carotene. And, um, you know, and, and, and to a certain degree, mycotoxin levels as well. Um, it was brought to my attention uh, pretty, I would say in 2022 or 2020. Yeah, it was, I think it was December 2022. We had a customer that was having some reproductive issues, but he was also having some weak calves and, and the vet had diagnosed it as a vitamin A and selenium deficiency and a vitamin E deficiency. And, you know, looking back at what we were feeding for a vitamin and trace mineral pack and all the things that were going into that cow, we found it very hard to understand how that could be possible because, you know, we were feeding in excess of what other than the selenium legally, you can only feed so much, but they were also supplementing with other supplements along with ours. So they should have had more than enough selenium. And then he was given BOCI and uh, oh, the vitamin shot, uh, min, uh, multimin, and it really wasn't responding that great. Uh, the calves would, but they kind of wouldn't. And it was almost like there was an underlying issue and we didn't know what the heck it was. Well, when we pulled the forage sample, it, it was, he was feeding a lot of corn stalks in his TMR and they were really bad was around Alan and Don. And we didn't know that because the stalks looked beautiful. They were dry, they were clean, but they came off a of drought ground. And so we picked something up out of the field there, obviously that uh, caused more issues than we realized. And so, I uh, had another customer that was basically putting embryos in and flushing cows and, and running into issues there. And that happened uh, probably in September of this year. And um, prior to that, I had been to a DSM meeting in Des Moines that Dan had invited me to. And I had been talking to Dan and Peter and, and uh, uh, I believe Erica or Aaron Swan and we were talking about different types of um, issues that could be causing some of the reproductive problems as well as the calf response, you know, IgG levels and all that. And so they invited me to the seminar and it was there. It was kind of like a light bulb went off and it was like, holy crap, we're completely missing the, the blood test or checking for beta carotene levels. And it was kind of like, 
how to, you know, it's just one of them things that you don't realize it until you're around other people and they start sharing stuff. And it's like, well, we've had fed nothing but brown grass and dry corn stalks and CRP. You know, there's nothing green that we're feeding most of these cattle because we're trying to keep our costs down. Well, and, you know, around here, alfalfa is pretty rare, especially here in Iowa. You, they, we really can't put up good quality alfalfa here just because of the humidity. And the, if it's not, if it's not too humid, it's raining. And, it, but, you know, the last couple of years have been so dry, there hasn't been much alfalfa raised anyway. So uh, beta carotene started to come in under the radar and, and uh, we started doing some testing. Dan and Aaron came out and we ran several cows through the chute on a couple of different herds and the beta carotene levels were exceptionally low. Um, and we were also dealing with uh, some mycotoxins at that particular ranch as well. And he's a, he, he raises breeding stock. And so those cattle are under a tremendous amount of stress anyway. You know, they, they basically are getting run through the chute four or five times to get set up, to get flushed, to get donor or recept and all that. So, you know, there's, there's just all that type of uh, environment and you've got incoming cows that you're trying to get eggs put into or embryos put into and and it's just a lot of challenges and so you know we were feeding biofix in that situation we saw that the beta carotene levels were low uh, we started feeding the victus plus in order to get the beta carotene levels up higher and we're starting to see some of those impact their blood so it was just basically really started feeding the Victus about November to December in some fall calving herds um, where we've been feeding it 60 plus days to the spring calvers. And so hopefully here in the next month or so, we start seeing some of the impact that that could potentially bring. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, this will help us uh, keep those cows that are getting embryos bred because he was running into some some issues there as well as as far as them uh, not staying bred. And then his IgG levels on his calves were really low last year. And again, that was because it had been a drought two years in a row now here in Iowa. And the Dakotas were dry two years prior to that. And they got some green grass last year. And it's interesting because their conception rates got better last year too. So there's to me, I think there's more to the beta carotene than than what I would have ever thought possible. And, you know, thanks to Dan and, and his crew there at DSM for kind of pointing those things out to me in that meeting. Um, I think uh, as time goes on, I think we've, we're we definitely going to do more blood work. Um, I think that's a great spot to start. And, um, you know, the, the resources that they have for helping me diagnose some of these issues has been tremendous definitely interesting and so many times we uh especially going into drought or locking cows up in these dry lot scenarios we forget about changing some of those minerals that that we're so used to cows being gra grazing green grass or being on green grass for longer periods of time and uh, you know some of these dry lot scenarios we run into a lot of vitamin a issues because of they're on low quality hay for such a long period of time that they, it just depletes the storage. I agree a thousand percent, and, you know, and what's the first thing, you know, when, when I'm dealing with people that are uh, running a, a, a donor and a recept program on a regular basis, they've always got cows in a dry lot, always. And it's, and what do they want to feed? The cheapest possible thing that they can. And so, you know, you start, you start, taking out good quality alfalfa or good quality grass hay and you start feeding distillers and corn stalks and you know yeah you're getting your protein you're getting your you're getting your energy you're getting those things the cows are fat and sassy and everything looks great and everything in the world should be bred and shouldn't have any issues right and then something like this comes up or something like the mycotoxins come up and it's like okay well Obviously, we overlook things that, that are definitely going to impact uh, the reproductive performance of those animals, but also 
uh, how well they milk and the quality of milk that they're giving to the calves. So I think um, I know for a fact that uh, my attitude toward this has changed and, and it may change again, but there, there is some, um, what I like about what we've done so far is the ability to know from blood work whether we've made an impact with the product that we're feeding. Because if we can prove to the customers that, you know, we raise that from, you know, being extremely low up to a, up to a level that where it should be, you know, how much are we going to see the returns of that? And I think uh, based on, again, it, it's how it, sometimes the, we learn so much from the dairy industry in the commercial cow herd, because dairymen are very quick to adapt to things that can potentially improve their bottom line. <clears throat> and they have great ways of capturing data. Commercial cow guys, they may not see it ever, but we know from research and understanding what the, what the products actually do, that they're going to have an impact that maybe they may not see right away, but long-term they probably will. But if a dairyman sees it and they can repeat the, the information over and over, it's, you know, it's to me, it's almost better than a, than a university research trial because they, they can repeat it time and time again. And so, yeah, I guess there's a lot of things that I'm definitely already starting to test. You know, we're putting some of the Victus and some of the Biofix and, and uh, High D. Those products are going to go into some of the test blocks that we're running this summer. Uh, some of them will be out on fescue, which is a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're hoping that we can see some impact of the blood work uh, that is definitely traceable. We can say, yep, this made a big difference. And... I guess that's kind of the goal and we'll see how things go this summer. Yeah. And some of those herds have y'all, especially you talked about a uh, producer in South Dakota, I believe that uh, just had a, it sounds like a decent mineral program. Um, oh yeah. Was giving multi men, et cetera, but it was still having issues. Uh, have y'all been looking at also liver biopsies of seeing where their liver status were for, for those minerals or? We did on some of those cows and uh, some of the liver biopsies came back favorable, you know, for the most part, but we weren't looking at any of the, the beta carotene stuff, but the vitamin E levels seemed to be okay. Uh -huh. uh, they were sporadic though. There were some that were low and there were some that were above normal. Yeah. So I think there's some inconsistencies there and, you know, and it, and it wasn't just animals that were on our feeding program. Uh, we had competitors' products out there. Yep. Um, we saw, and it didn't matter. I mean, honestly, I think there was more to do. It had way more to do with the impact of the drought over time and how that, you know, I think that lapse of eight or 12 months of not having enough beta carotene compounded the problems. Yeah. And then the mycotoxins, obviously, they wreak havoc wherever if they're high enough, they'll, they'll cause some major problems. But I think there's all that just kind of drew into a perfect storm. And it was like, you know, it, it got to the point to where it became noticeable. Right. You know, before, you know, when you're feeding right along and you don't even think about it, well, you know, I got 90% conception rate this year. Well, two years ago when we had fresh green grass, you were at 95. Well, you don't think, well, it's only 3%. And yeah. You know, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. But then all of a sudden, two years later, you're down into the, just say, 70s. And that's, I'm just throwing a number out there, but it definitely gets your attention. And when you're talking about embryos or uh, when you're talking about recips and flushing cows and you're having impacts on those, uh -huh. the dollars start to show up real fast. And it's like, okay, how come we're not getting, how come, you know, we're putting fresh embryos into these, Re, or uh, recip cows and why are they not staying why are they losing them and you know that that pro that that program in and of itself is very challenging just because of all the moving parts and you know you've got environmental issues you've got cattle running through the chute all the time and everything has to be done at the correct time in the correct 
mode or whatever. Right. And then you start throwing a mycotoxin issue in there and beta carotene issue in there. You just compounded the problem. Yeah. But again, back to the ability to do, like you said, liver biopsies and, and blood work to see where you're at. I think that's, I think that's going to be more and more important going forward, especially on a commercial or on the uh, performance breeding programs, I'll call it basically, where they're trying to get flesh cows and, and put in embryos. Yeah, there's been so many times when working with producers that you're scratching your head of, I don't understand what your problem is because Mm -hmm. you're doing everything right and you're still getting these low pregnancy rates. And and it's just, it's, it makes it tough because, you know, everything's checking the boxes. And and so you're right. Sometimes we have to dig really deep into the scenario to to find out exactly what's going on. And it it makes it tough at times. And for a producer, it's very tough because now they're spending more money on, you know, getting stuff analyzed. And and it's not very simple sometimes to find that, that, that answer to what's the problem. And so many times it's, it's so inconsistent too. Like you said, is sometimes this stuff just creeps up on you that for, you know, you can go five years with that bad mineral program and, after five years, that six year hits you hard. And, you know, it's not a every year type of situation that you're hit hard, but you sooner or later with Matt, with a bad mineral program, you can really see that big dip in yeah. performance. Yeah, I agree. And so it's not like the dairy industry, like I said, it, where, you know, they see that milk every day. They see performance every day for cow calf producer. It's a long span time, right? And yeah. it's, it's hard to pick up some of those and understand what is going on. Right. So do, it does make you jealous of the dairy industry and their ability to collect data to make decisions. But, you know, we need to use them more because they can. And, you know, the fact that they can pull an IgG on a cow in a matter of minutes and and see where that level's at. And they can also know what the beta carotene level was, you know, 60 days prior to her having her calf and did they impact it feeding, you know, the Victus plus or anything like that. And then what potential impact did that have on IgG levels? If they were running a split trial, which some of them I'm sure have where they, you know, so many cows, they drew blood on them. They knew what the beta carotene level was going into it 60 days prior to calving and they feed it through group A and not to group B. And then check IgG levels, right. check beta carotene levels, that calving. And, you know, that you can't do that in a commercial cow, cow herd feasibly. Uh, but in a dairy herd, they can, they can collect that information relatively quick. And, uh, you know, I think we need to be able, I, I, I think we need to watch what they're doing with a lot of their programs because those cows basically are dry lot 365 days of the year, you know. And so they're going to feed good quality alfalfa for the most part. Most of them will, but they'll also try to feed cheap ration when they can. You know, I've worked with uh, some pretty big dairies over the, over the years. And uh, there was one down in Texas where we treated a bunch of corn stalks for, and, you know, we were feeding that to uh, virgin heifers and stuff like that. So that it's not like, it's not like they're feeding high quality forage to those animals all the time. Right. You know, they're, they're going to look for something relatively cheap. Yep. Um, just like any commercial cow would, guy would. So I think it's interesting, uh, you know, just having the resources uh, like DSM to lean on, to reach out to. Uh, I wouldn't have found any of this stuff out if it hadn't have been my relationship with Dan. You know, mm-hmm. Dan, Yeah. basically him and I worked together at ADM. I was running across some of these problems and I had reached out to him and a couple other colleagues from the past that, you know, it's just kind of like scratch my head. What the heck's going on? How come this right. isn't, isn't making sense? And it was, it was Dan that kind of said, Hey, have you ever looked at doing this or have you ever thought about this? And it's like, Oh well, no, not really. And then it was, it wasn't until I went to the meeting in Des Moines that everything kind of hit. It was like, Holy crap. This, this could be the potential problem. And, and when, of course, when we drew the blood and it was, they were all low, it was like, mm. this could be it. So we'll find out more. I, yeah. you know, I, I'm excited about the potential for it. And I think there's a lot of arrows pointing to that direction that that could be the problem. 
It may not be, but it'll help us look forward on uh, seeing what impact it's going to have on IGG levels. And I think that can be a huge deal for anybody. So are you thinking it's or having a impact on colostrum quality at that point that's driving that? Yeah, I think I think uh, getting that in high D uh, both uh-huh. in there and and trying to calm down the toxins that could be floating out there. You know, we've just gone to those three uh, ingredients, you know, the Biofix Plus, the Victus Transition and the uh, uh, high D you know, kind of throwing everything at them. And, but, you know, the neat thing is being able to really check the beta carotene, I think for us is probably going to be, to me, that makes the most sense. That's the one that's probably a big culprit, even though the toxins, we can check the feed for that. And we do. And, and it seems like there's always some there, but it may not be real high in, you know, if it's if it's relatively high in one of the feed ingredients, obviously we've adjusted the rations accordingly, right. so we can still use that feed stuff up and and you know just put basically we're putting the biofix in there just in case, yeah. and you know it's kind of like well we're going to put this in there just in case that's what's causing the problem. To me, I think the beta carotene's a bigger issue because of the drought that we've had. You know, we just haven't had good green forage. Yeah, even when they went out to pasture, they had they had. Uh, uh, three good months or two good months of, of green grass. And then it, then it was brown and he was feeding hay and it was actually CRP hay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, low protein and, and not very green at all. Most of it's got more dead material in it than it does green. And so, um, it was interesting how some of his recips had better, uh, conception rates because, they were flushed on ryegrass and and so you know it was like okay well ryegrass probably raised the beta carotene levels so oh. it's just crazy how some of that stuff just kind of falls together and I think I it know. does I'm I'm hopeful that this is a direction that makes sense and uh, it's not cheap to do it but in their situation sticking a high dollar embryo in a cow and it and it not staying is not good either. We're going to have increased droughts, Absolutely. and so we're going to have increased times of dry periods. That's going to be a bigger problem that cow-calf producers are faced with. I don't think we have a good enough handle on vitamin A anyways for, from forage bases, from requirements. Um, and so I think that's that's one of the challenges that we have is that I don't think we have good enough data to support what is the requirement, what is the truly need, and what's what's the absorption and use of what's in our forages. And so I think so so many so much of that older data may not be valid of how they analyze that, and that may be some of our issues that we're faced with. We we think we're doing a good job, but we're not. Right, and yeah, and another thing that just kind of popped into my head, and I remember having this conversation with Dan, and and I believe it was Peter that. Uh, you know, we were talking about, I can remember 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when byproducts really started becoming a big part in Midwest. And, you know, so we had all these guys that were starting to feed distillers and syrup and all these different things to cows. And, and uh, you know, instead of feeding good quality alfalfa, they were supplementing corn stalks in to use their corn stalks. And, And then after about three or four years, everybody said, well, there's too much sulfur in that feed and we can't feed it because it's, it's killing our conception rates. Uh Was that what killed it? Or was it going back to beta carotene because we pulled all the green stuff out of the diet? Right. So, you know, I don't know, but I've got customers that have fed byproducts for 30 years and their conception rates are as good as anybody, Uh but you look back at a lot of their diets, they were still feeding alfalfa or grass hay or something else that was green corn silage, you know? So, so, and that's, you know, and there's another thing there is, you know, we got good high beta carotene levels in corn silage when we first chop it, but most of the guys aren't going to feed it until March and April. So, Mm -hmm. you know, did it, what happened to beta carotene levels of the silage at that point? And it goes down. You know, how much I can't remember, but I do remember uh, 
some of the information that Dan had from one of the dairy herds was showing forage quality samples over time. Um, you know, beta carotene is going to start to go out of the corn silage over time. So how much does that play into it? And how much of that silage are you actually feeding? How much is, you know, the intake of any mineral or, you know, go back to the cow calf to dairy site is they, they have very controlled diets that they control what that cow eats. We do not, unless you're in a dry lot scenario. You know, so we've got high variation in intake of mineral supplements. We have high variation in, in what truly they're eating on a grazing diet is how much benefit are you think you're seeing by force feeding in your scenario of force feeding certain products to increase, you know, better carotene or, or, or whatever. I think on these high performance breeding programs, uh, I, depending on how everything comes out this spring, but it would be something that I would rec absolutely recommend that it gets force fed one way, shape or form. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the nice part about the block that we manufacture, it's not a one pound supplement. You know, it's, it's designed for a two to four pound intake. We've got another one that's four to six pounds. Um, so it depends on what time of year it is. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll back off of that block when the grass is really green. So say, for example, we put a block out there that has a two to four pound intake and May grass greens up and, and they only eat a pound and a half. Well, mm. is that enough? Possibly would be because now we got green grass and, you know, so there's some beta carotene coming from there and, and better nutrient profile in general of the lush green grass. Um, where I think it's going to probably play into a bigger role is when we get into fall calving herds that are out on June, July, August burnt up pasture. And now the intake goes to three and a half to four pounds. Well, then we know we can get the level into them that we need. And so the block kind of follows the forage to a certain degree. So right. you're going to have better intake when the forages are brown and dormant, corn stalks, or, you know, if you're grazing stock fields, or if you're winter grazing grass in North Dakota or, or Missouri, um, you know, the quality of that grass obviously isn't as good as it would be in May and June or, you know, May, April and May. So I think, uh, you know, having a, having a supplement that's basically kind of follows the forage on intake, I think that's pretty important, but we can also manipulate those, that intake as well. You know, in, in this situation where we're really trying to make sure that the beta carotene levels are being high enough in the, in the high D and, and uh, all that is being done correctly. We just need to make sure that the supplement is palatable enough in those times of the year, regardless, mm. you know, so, so in a roundabout way, yes, we can force feed it through, through our supplement that we're manufacturing. It, yeah. It's going to take a little bit of, little bit of doing to get everything dialed in where we want it exactly, but it could be done. So I think that's kind of the approach that we need to take. And, you know, especially we're, we're, we're trying to increase stocking rates on pastures. So oh. now not only are you going to graze it down pretty short in a drought year, um, it also makes us feed more of our supplement uh, at the startup. So we're going to be more inclined to try to design a supplement that they'll still eat two to three pounds in April and May, and then adjust the formula to go to a different type of block when the grass starts to go. So we'll figure it out. Just going to take some time. Are, are you starting to work with some universities to do controlled replicated studies? Or are you working with? We them? haven't yet. And I'm not opposed to doing that at some point. Um, you know, right now I've leaned really heavily on Dan and his team to kind of help get the blood work and all that. You know, I think we need to, we need to get our own individual baseline stuff going. And then I think uh, it'll give us a better indication going forward of how important it is. Um, right now, I feel like it's critical in some situations, uh, but we want to make sure that we're delivering it in a package that's 
uh, correct for uh, that producer, but also correct for the animal. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of, especially in the Midwest, of grazing corn stalks, of fall calving grazing corn stalks. There's a lot of applications that this could truly benefit a producer. You know, one, it's hard to supplement cows grazing corn stalks from the standpoint of you don't own that land usually. You're leasing it, and they don't want you pouring something on, uh, on that leased land. And so, you know, having a delivery mechanism that someone can come and drop off, I'm, I'm assuming you could feed this, you know, drop a, a block off once every, you know, twice a week type scenario mm-hmm. that you're not out there every day. Right. It is, it, it's a great use for a lot of cow-calf producers that can't be there every day to feed something. Yeah, part of the reason why we made the block is to basically help us be competitive against tube feeding. Um, you know, cube feeding, you still need to do it every day if you can, and then you got a truck and you got a driver and all the equipment cost with that. Plus you're pulling cows off their normal grazing activity. Cause when they hear the cube truck coming, they're already running from three miles and you know, the blocks out there, let that cow go and eat it as she wants to The boss cow isn't going to kick her out of the way. So there's some neat things with the supplement that we've got. Um, to help us, you know, really extend the forage, but also uh, provide extra nutrition to her in a package that's cost competitive to what you would with a range gate. So that's kind of the goal. So are these like 35, 50 pound blocks, press blocks or? No, they're, they're a 2000 pound block. 2000 pound block. Yeah. They're in a, they're in a uh, poly tote basically. Okay. So they set that out and cut a hole in it and let the cow eat it right out of the, out of the tote bag. So you got to have a tractor, you know, so a lot of guys, uh, they'll lift them with bale vids. If you go to our website, it's crfconsulting.net. And, um, uh, there's some videos and stuff that they can look at on there. If they got questions, they can call me as well. Well, wow, that's great. It's great. It seems like a lot of flexibility to, to be able to feed and the ability to put and, and put in a, you know, feed additives that, that have impacts that sometimes it's hard to get to companies to add different feed additives for. I agree a thousand percent. And we've tested a lot of different products uh, over the last three years. And, and there was, there was a lot of people very confident that the process that we were putting it through, uh, you know, because some of the, the things that we do to change the digestibility of the fibers that we're putting into the block are not favorable for some things. So mm-hmm. just to give you an example, like active yeast and some of that stuff, the heat and the temperature and the, right. and the pH all takes, kills it basically. So there's some things that we just cannot put in the block. So, you know, getting that dialed in and making sure that what we're putting in there is actually being utilized instead of destroyed is. Well, John, is, is there anything else that we missed that we want to touch on before wrapping this up? can't think of anything it's time for our famous three all right so a few questions for you for our listeners that may be interested is what what's your favorite go-to beef book resource that you that you used to have on standby you know uh i do a lot on google (laughs) and so I use Google a lot. That's probably my number one resource. I can reach out to different universities. I can reach out to different companies in a non-biased way. And so I can, you know, kind of do some research on different topics, different things. And uh, that's probably my number one go-to would probably be Google, whether it's, whether it's right or wrong, but that's kind of, but I do have some other ones that are just kind of in my in the top drawer of my desk that are probably more associated to vitamins and minerals and and uh mycotoxins lately any favorite book or resource outside of agriculture i can't say that there's anything that just stands right out you know i love the information that uh, i've collected over the years from different companies you know there's there's certain things that you know, I'm a Zimpro fan because of all the research that they've done. I've worked closely with Zimpro. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've worked with you guys. Uh, there's some resources that just continually provide me new information. 
DSM is one of those, Simpro is one of them, uh, Filio. You know, there's several different companies that I've worked with. And, and it's not that I'm necessarily uh, tied to them in any way, shape, or form. It's more of they're bringing me information that I think is useful. They've kind of proven themselves. Uh, not that the others can't prove it to me. It's just that's kind of a little bit of a bias, I guess you would say. But I. So our last question is, what sets a successful beef professional apart from those that are not? Listening. I think listening is critical, you know, and I was taught that very early in my career. I had some great people that I worked with. And, and I think I counted one time, and this probably been 15 years ago, I had worked with like over 70 different PhD consultants over my career. And that number's probably doubled since then. The amount of knowledge that you get from other people is overwhelming. I mean, and there's there's people that are brilliant. And uh, I, even in my ADM career, when we were doing the corn store project, the people from Monsanto and John Deere and Hilco, the, the people that make equipment and, you know, all that is just like, holy cow, I didn't know that. And it's better than any education I've ever gotten out of college. And I shouldn't say better. It's it's practical and it's it's in place. It's it you see it working. You see why they did it that way. Problem solving is critical. And in order to fix the problem, we got to kind of have our ears open and and be very uh, open minded, because it's pretty easy for us over thirty plus years of being in the business to have an opinion. It can be a detriment. Because we get one track mind and it's like, ah, it's got to be this, it's got to be this. And then you get hit over the head by somebody and it says, well, it could be this. And those are the things, those are the things that I think are important is to be willing to listen to other people's opinions. If it wouldn't have been for that, I don't think I'd be talking about what we're talking about today. Because the first thing you want to do is just chalk it up to, well, we didn't do something right. We didn't get them back to you. And it may not even be that at all. So keep learning. That's a great answer. Well, I appreciate the time and uh, enjoyed talking to you, getting to know uh, your business and, and what you're doing. So I think uh, we'll have a lot of viewers that would agree with that. Very good.